You're back on stand with Kelly and Denali Chewbacca, and we are talking to Jared Gerker, who is running for state Senate in Alaska. He is running against heavily union backed Kelly Merrick, who claims to be a Republican, but has voted over 90% of the time with one of the top Democrat liberal leftists in the state, our own version of the squad, Forrest Dunbar. And so Jared, I wanna start out with sharing a little bit about our personal story with the viewers who may not know. Uh, Jared and I worked together for the governor and one of the very first um, incidents that we found ourselves in together, we were kind of in the trenches together on this, was the first strike the state of Alaska has seen in 40 years, over 40 years. And I think that this is relevant because you're going up against people who claim that they represent workers in Alaska. But what I think I saw when we were negotiating with unions in the state is that so many of the unions that we face actually represent union bosses. And they don't actually represent the needs of the worker. So for a little bit of context, and then I'll let you tell your side of the story on this. Um, we were representing, we were negotiating with a union who served on the Alaska Marine Highway System. And I don't think that the workers ever knew this part of the story, but the negotiator they sent up from California was advocating for a pay raise so high for these workers that what it would have really meant is the workers would have had to have been shut down from work for such a significant part of the year that their take home pay would have been significantly lower than the pay raise that we were offering them. So we were actually trying to offer them higher pay as well as keep our coastal communities open to having access year round. And the union bosses were arguing for lower pay and shutting down the coastal communities. And suffice it to say, that wasn't gonna fly with you and me and we were willing to go to a strike over it and we won. And it meant a lot of sleepless nights. And not only did we win and get a pay raise for our workers, uh, but we also, fought to make sure that the union had to pay the state back for the strike. I want you to talk about how much passion and care you have for workers and making sure that they get what they deserve when it comes to workers' rights. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. Look, anytime we're talking labor contracts, there's, there's, two, there's two interests at play on the other side. There's the actual uh, workers' interest, and then there's the union bosses. Mm -hmm. And there, there's an important, important distinction to be had here because, by and large, uh, the the people who comprise the workforce, they're good, God-fearing, regular people, many of whom, you know, Republicans. They just want to provide a, a good living for their family, and that that's commendable. That's I nothing wrong with that. In fact, I, I encourage that, and that was one of the biggest things that I fought uh, that you and I fought to protect in all of the labor contracts. We need, needed fiscal responsibility, and they needed to also, you know, protect actual workers' rights. Uh, what we didn't want to see was empowering and emboldening the, the union bosses who were, frankly, at odds with the actual values and the actual interest of the membership. Right. And uh, yeah, that was one of the biggest battles that we had. And, and the the example with the ferry strike is a, is a really great example of that, because had we given the union bosses what they wanted, a whole bunch of workers would have been laid off. The communities mm -hmm. would have been harmed, and uh, and they and they didn't care, right? right? And they they had, they had this lady. She came up from California. She she cut her teeth on the Crowley, uh, you know, labor disputes in the '90s, and so a very hard line, very leftist person. And uh, and when we said, hey, how in the world do you think we're supposed to afford this? Like, what what's where's this money coming from? And their response was, well, you, you take it from that $80 billion slush fund the state has. Now, they're, they're talking about the PFD. Right. And it's like, well, hey, wait a second. <laughs> That's not my money. That's not your money. We're not negotiating with the people's money like that. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's, a real, it's, a, it's a real challenge to balance, those, uh, to balance those needs. And I'm proud of the work that we did do because I, I think we did put the, the workers for, first because the contract we got resulted in uh, continued service throughout Southeast Alaska and keeping as many employees as possible uh, paid and on the ships and, and running and, and continuing to uh, be able to provide for their families. And it's a delicate balancing act, I get it. But you know, another example here locally, take, uh, take APDEA, right? It's, uh, it's the, the actual, and they represent the law enforcement, the, the cops here in Anchorage. And they have, a, they have a tremendous responsibility, right? Because our law enforcement does a tremendous job. They, they put their lives on the line every single day to protect this community. And then they've got the union that's going around and supporting left-wing candidates and causes that don't act doesn't actually support the mem the mm -hmm. the membership and the mission of the membership right i believe they they supported la france for mayor and now there's been a, a spate of officer involved shootings here in here in anchorage she doesn't even and apologize what, for the deaths it's no, horrific mm -hmm. it's terrible 
terrible. Yeah. And she's she's making it harder for law enforcement to do their job. That's right. And so it's just it's that it's there's always that that balancing act of interest there. And, and we've got to do a better job of actually representing the members. And I think that comes back with being able to push back on the union boss and saying, no, this is not what is in the membership's best interest. Mm -hmm. This is not what's in the people's best interest. Because at the end of the day, when you're negotiating public contracts, that's one of the, the main you know, considerations that has to be taken into account as well. One of the reasons I wanted to share this story is because oftentimes we'll have a candidate with ideas against a candidate with experience. And I think it's really important that people understand you've got significant experience in Juno and it's it's not easy to walk in as a new person and then have your eyes open to all of the political forces in Juno that tug at you and pressure you and force you into compromises. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, Jared, how do we know you're not going to turn out just like Kelly? And I think it's important that people know you've already been tested and through the heat and fire of the pressures of Juno and you didn't cave. And when people weren't looking and you weren't running for an office and you you weren't accountable to the people, you were just accountable to principle. You stood it for what you believed and you didn't cave and you won. And I, I know a lot of people don't know that story because it's a hard story to put on a palm card. So I wanted to make sure to, to share it because we have record versus record here, not ideas and rhetoric versus record. Right. No, that's exactly right. And, and look, and I appreciate that. And we went to Juno to fight the swamp. Kelly went to Juno to be the swamp. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's a good way to put it. Jared, with our last couple of minutes here, could you dive into your platform a little bit more? Tell us about what kinds of things you'd want to accomplish during your first term for your district. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I mentioned uh, bail and pretrial a little bit earlier. Uh, that has to be first and foremost when we're talking about meaningful criminal justice reform. If we don't deal with bail and pretrial where we're just continuing to let violent criminals back out on the streets, it's like trying to add a, a second layer to your house while the first floor is on fire. So we have to deal with bail and pretrial. Um, it's completely insane that we're releasing violent criminals uh, back on the streets with little to no bail. That needs to be that needs to be reformed, needs to be cleaned up. Um, another thing that needs to happen is we need to restructure the public defenders. I think there's a massive bottleneck there due to a, a worker shortage. And honestly, it's really tough work and it's hard to draw people into that. Um, so I've got a couple ideas on how to restructure that and, and, and really streamline and open up the labor pool to you know hundreds of more attorneys across the state. Um, so criminal justice reform, that's number one. Number two, we need a realistic fiscal plan. We don't have one really. Um, and instead, what they've been doing for years is mm -hmm. they've, been, um, they've been drawing money from the PFD to continue to feed and grow government, government spending. They haven't really cut anything too much. And so we need to have a serious conversation about what that looks like. And a part of that has to be a realistic spending cap. Because otherwise, if we don't stop the growth of government and put it within put it within a box, you know, like let it let it grow with inflation, you know, that sort of thing, of course. Uh, but if we don't if we don't artificially say no, this is how much it's going to be, then the government's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And we're seeing that, you know, with this with what this legislative uh, with what this legislature is doing right now. And um, you know, they they they're continuing to grow government. They passed a. a a massive nine billion dollar defined benefits pension plan out of the senate last year with zero new revenues identified so what does that mean well that that means the pfd is gone first and foremost that's going to go first and then we're gonna have an income tax and then a sales tax and then we might have to increase the income tax a few years later because uh, it's not quite performing as well and then and if we're going to increase the sales tax and now we're going to need you know this tax and that tax we just need to put we can put all of that to to rest if we have a realistic spending cap that caps the growth of government and um and then we won't really need all these new revenues right we can bring some finality we can bring a little bit of structure a little bit of actual protection to the pfd because right now at the rate it's going they're taking 75 percent of it right now 75 to 100 is not that far and we're we're, we're just a couple years out from that so a fiscal plan has to encapsulate all of that legislature doesn't have one and we we desperately need one. Yeah, it really baffles me when these incumbents say that they're pro PFD and yet they have taken not a single step to cut the budget or cap spending and we all know that the only way that they are funding their wish list of budget items is by taking the money from the people that is statutorily protected. So they are violating the law, laws they've created in order to spend down our money to fund their pet projects, their pork bills, 
but with no regard for the future. And then they'll come back and campaign on I'm pro PFD, but they won't actually do the hard work of being pro PFD. I am absolutely uninterested in what a politician says. I am only an un I am only interested in what policy makers do because results speak so much louder than rhetoric. And that's what I appreciate is that you actually articulated a real plan to drive real results. And that is hard to do in Juno, but I know that you've already done it. And that's why I am so excited to have been to be supporting you and to be endorsing you for this race. We'll let you take it away with a wrap up, but I want to just remind people support Jared at Jared for Alaska.com. Jared, what are your last words for us? Yeah, look, here's the thing. Um, this is what I want to tell everybody. Alaska is on a path of decline and we don't have to be right. It's a choice. We can choose a different path. And, uh, and we, we present a very stark contrast between myself and Kelly Merrick and the paths that Alaska has. And so if you think that Alaska is doing okay, if you're in the, the Kelly Merrick crowd, like, no, everything's going perfectly. Um, then you're probably, uh, then you're, you know, then you're probably not really dealing with what's actually going on. And most Alaskans realize that most Alaskans see this, that we're on a path of decline and it's time for a reversal. And so early voting starts in a few days and we're going to be pushing it really hard, getting our get out the vote, um, you know, ready and, and rolling so we can get out there and really drive the message home. Um, we're almost here at the finish line. We just need to get over the, we just need to get over that last little hump. And, um, and, it, and a lot of people see it. A lot of people see that this is a very consequential election for the state not only for the state, but also for the nation, like what's going on at the presidential level. Yeah, that's and right. So, yeah. So we've got, a, we've got a real big choice here. Uh, the, the contrast could not be any more stark and we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, that's right. I appreciate that, Jared. And we're glad that you've been on the show. This is Jared Gerker, Jared for Alaska.com. We're supporting him for Senate. And thank you so much for being on the show, Jared. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're coming up to our break. So stand by. We'll be right back with Representative Ben Carpenter running for Senate in the Kenai Peninsula. You're not going to want to miss this. Stand by. <laughs> 